Welcome to the concert hall at the School of Music in the College of the Arts at USF. At this time, we ask you to please silence your cell phones. We also remind you that the use of recording devices and flash photography are strictly prohibited in the hall. In the event of an emergency, exits are located to your left and right sides in the concert hall. If you must leave this performance at any time, please wait for a member of the house staff to guide you back to your seat. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the performance. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Smithman, and I'm a third year student here at Cooley Law School. First, I would like you ask all to be seated. Thank you. I'd like to welcome everyone today to the Western Michigan University Thomas M. Cooley Law School graduation ceremony for the Horace Gray class. Today, we will graduate our Juris Doctor candidates. The assembly is requested to stand while the invocation is pronounced by visiting professor Amanda Fisher. We ask you to please remain standing after the invocation for the national anthem. Professor Fisher. Good afternoon. I am honored to be here with you all today on such an extraordinary occasion. 
You all should be so incredibly proud of yourselves. Whenever you complete a task, especially one that has been particularly taxing, particularly daunting, one that has pushed you beyond your comfort, pushed you to find the limits of your abilities, stop, take a moment, reflect, and revel in this accomplishment. But don't stay there too long. There's more work to do. Now, you may think I'm talking about the bar exam, and I am. But getting your bar card is just one more stop on your journey. Each of you is standing on the cusp of your next chapter. As you look towards your futures in the legal profession, I have three hopes for you. I hope that you will remember to be kind. The legal profession sometimes gets a bad rap. It's adversarial in nature. But I encourage you to imagine what you would want the profession to look like, to feel like, and put it into practice. You have the power to make change. Second, I hope that you will own your journey. There will be good days and bad days, but every day is your day. Admit your mistakes and learn from them. Stay humble in your accomplishments, but never let anyone dim your light. Third, I hope that you never stop learning. Law school may be over, but lawyers are lifetime students. I had the distinct pleasure of teaching many of you during your transition to law school. We talked about growth mindset then, and we're going to talk about it again now. There's always more to learn and room to grow. Take advantage of the opportunities and resources that will allow you to do just that. Now, as you all enter the next chapter, take time to reflect and revel and then get back to work. I am so proud of you. Go show this profession what Cooley grads can do. Thank you, Professor Fisher. Here to sing our national anthem is soon to be graduate and our student speaker, Kimberly Lewis. twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gay proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of all the free and the Thank you, Kimberly. That was outstanding. For letting her catch her breath just for a second, but I wanted to let you know that the valedictory will be presented 
by Kimberly Lewis. <laughs> she was selected by the students of the Horace Gray class from the Tampa Bay campus to present the class's farewell comments. Kimberly? Honored guests, family members, friends, loved ones, and incredible graduates. That is right there. I am extremely honored and humbled to be standing in front of you today. I mean, we are wearing these crazy outfits <laughs> with these crazy hats. And we are about to get our Juris Doctor degree. Now, many of us in this room will remember when we got the news that we were going to go online to finish the rest of our law school career. There were a lot of unknowns. We weren't sure what the rest of our education was going to look like. We didn't know what it was going to feel like. But there are those among us today that they did their entire degree online. And the thing about that is, we all showed fortitude. We all showed grit, and this is the attitude that we all bring to the table. You know, we're standing here today, we're here today because we dug in deep, and we found a way to overcome whatever was put before us. The magnitude of what we accomplished should not be understated because regardless what was thrown our way, we met each challenge head on and we kept our eye on the goal. And we could not have done this alone. This graduating class has many to thank. And the first is our families and loved ones. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for sacrificing for us. There are no words of gratitude encompassing enough to convey how we feel about the time and the investment that you made in us so that we may succeed. From the bottom of our hearts, we want to say to all of you, thank you. But let's not forget, there are students who came to our hallowed institution with no support, little to no family, and only a desire to better themselves and practice the noble profession of law. Once here, many of them, like us, found amongst the staff and faculty a second family, a family that understood what it was like to go to law school, and they had the task of shaping us to think like lawyers, instilling in us the code of professionalism and ethics that we carry with us throughout our careers. And they imparted the necessary wisdom and substantive law that form our foundations going forward. Our professors spent countless hours of their days and their nights shaping us into what this profession requires, advocates. And they made law something we could understand. There's only one person that could make wills, trusts, and estates exciting, and that is Professor Dan Matthews. Thank goodness for Professor Beery's templates, weekly templates, because, yep, yeah, right? Because they made that constitutional law a little less squiggly and a little bit more tangible. And who can forget Professor Neville Yule, who required every time we went to her lectures, she demanded from us excellence or nothing at all. Now, we weren't always excellent. Some of us, including myself, grasped things a little slower than others. But these professors worked with us and encouraged us 
even when we still had no ideas what the rules of perpetuity are. <laughs> well, we thank you. We thank you for everything you did for us. And we want you to know that once we embark upon our next chapter, we want to be able to reach out to you and gain wise counsel from you. Because even though we're graduating, we still need our mentors. The completion of this part of our journey is a testament not only to our own strengths, but the strengths of everyone around us. This entire community of individuals, family members, professors, and staff who helped us arrive today. But there is only one group that will know what it is like to graduate law in a pandemic, and that is this group right here. Listen, we learned from each other. We formed relationships that can never be broken. We cried together. We laughed together. We supported each other. And yes, we became family. When you look at the face of your fellow graduate, you know they know. They know what this journey is like. And each of us has weathered the storm of law school and we have come out the other side triumphant. Now, law school is an extraordinary experience, and we have many incredible memories. But remember, these experiences don't define us. Only we can define who we are and who we will be in the future. So as you leave today, Take a moment to reflect on who you are, who you've become, and how you want to define your future, and savor this momentous achievement. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., never be afraid to do what is right, especially if the well-being of a person or an animal is at stake. Society's punishments are small compared to the wounds we inflict on our soul when we look the other way. This class will not look the other way. Congratulations, Horace Gray Class 2021. Thank you very much, Kimberly. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege at this time to present to you the President and Dean of Western Michigan University Cooley Law School, James McGrath, who will provide our welcome and introduce our commencement speaker. All right. Well, I'm going to welcome everybody in just a quick minute, but a few quick thank yous before I get there. I'd like to thank, of course, Karen Smithman, our Master of Ceremonies. <laughs> I see Don. Professor Amanda Fisher for her uplifting and just wonderful uh, in invocation. I, I think you guys are all going to make her very proud. <laughs> and, of course, I can't forget to thank Kimberly Lewis for an amazing performance of our national anthem. What the <laughs> lovely. I was afraid I was going to have to come out and do a song and then a speech like she did. Uh, <laughs> luckily, you'll be spared that. And of course, thank you for that really inspiring and very grateful uh, farewell address for the, the class of the Horace Gray class. That's very nicely done. So December 19th, 2021, yeah, a special day, a special day for all of our graduates and their families. Often our, graduate, our graduations fall on a date that has some special significance, like just last year, it fell on the International Day of Education. Wow, what a great thing for people who spend their whole lives in school, right? And then uh, just recently, this is the last time here in Tampa Bay, it was on 9-11, and a very auspicious day to have a graduation as well. What about December 19th? 
well, I did a little research. Let's just see. December 19th is, I can't be right, uh, National Hard Candy Day. What? <laughs> well, it's also National Oatmeal Muffin Day. <laughs> National Emo Day. Is that a thing? And finally, this is probably the only usable one here in Florida, National Look for an Evergreen Day. Um, good luck. Uh, it's Christmas, you know, but I was hoping for something with a little more gravitas than any of those uh, for memorializing our accomplishments here today, your accomplishments. I'll take, I'll take credit for it, okay. Uh, but I hope you'll look fondly every time you see December 19th in the calendar and maybe take a moment and reach out to one of your colleagues you haven't seen for a while. But I do know that a lot of you are going to keep in touch with each other over the years because you've formed a bond through the rigors of law school that can't be undone. Everybody, our graduates today are about to become lawyers. They're going to have earned some very special powers with commensurate responsibilities to serve. And what an awesome, awesome privilege it is to be a member of this noble profession, particularly at this uh, time of great uncertainty. We can all talk about wanting to go back to the way things were before COVID, and we're not even close to being post-COVID. I think we all know that. And what the world is going to look like post-COVID has yet to be written. You know, many courts are still going to continue to hold proceedings virtually, and all kinds of businesses are re-examining business as usual. So you could look at this time of confusion and concern uh, as one of, you know, a horrible time, or you could look at it as an incredible opportunity, a chance to make a meaningful change that our world desperately needs. Now, I can't tell you what you should do to be part of the positive change that our world needs because we all must find that path that best suits our own journey. I only hope that we can respect and encourage each other as we work to positively shape our future. And as we face new crises, and there will always be new challenges, we have an opportunity to learn from the past. We can fix what needs repair and build a shared understanding of what equality, justice, and inclusion in this new era must look like. The world needs you, and I know you're ready to lead. Now, most all of you know, because we've, we've already heard it, uh, that because of the pandemic, all of our graduates left classes one day in 2020 and had no idea they weren't going to be coming to the classroom again. Uh, some of them never made it back. Law school became virtual for all of us. And as you can see, things aren't quite back to normal yet. And if you can't see anybody's faces here today, uh, we have a few extra safety precautions to keep us all safe. But we're going to get the job done because that's what WMU Cooley graduates do, you get the job done. So let's get this graduation done. Again, let me offer a hearty congratulations uh, and a hearty uh, to the <laughs> Horace Gray class and a big welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for being here today. Oh. <laughs> I, I should point out we have a couple of distinguished guests. Uh, we have a board member and also a beloved uh, faculty member, uh, Mustafa Amin. We have a number of members of our staff that are here, but most of them are behind the scenes taking care of things like they always do, taking care of you and me and everybody else. And of course, thank you for showing up. The reason we're here, our class, our, their graduates, the Horace Gray class of 2021. And I want to give a special welcome and thank you to all the people who have helped our graduates get here today, whether your family, your friends, uh, someone you just <laughs> met on the way in, whether, whatever you've done to help our graduates get here today, thank you so much. We know, you know, how committed all of our graduates were to getting here today. And thank you for all the support. Maybe it was emotional, maybe it was running flashcards with them, maybe it was financial. Whatever you did to get them here today, thank you very much to the family and friends. And I would also like to say, it's over. <laughs> I would like to say it's over, but I can't, right? We all know there's one big thing coming up, right? And that's that bar exam. So bear with us, family and friends. You're not going to get them back quite just yet, but we'll, we'll get them back to you soon. So we're going to celebrate the success today, because you've all earned a really great and well-deserved break. But very soon, you'll have to get back to that challenge that's awaiting all of you. So to all of our family and friends, just bear with us for one big effort and enjoy this very special day. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Desmond Mead. Desmond Mead is a formerly homeless, returning citizen who overcame many obstacles to eventually become the president 
of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, known as the FRRC. Chair of Floridians for a Fair Democracy, a graduate of Miami-Dade College, Florida International University College of Law, a, a Ford Global Fellow, and a 2021 MacArthur Genius Fellow. Wow. Yeah, he was recognized by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2019. Desmond presently leads efforts to empower and civically re-engage local communities across the state and to reshape the local, state, and national criminal justice policies. And his work has resulted in being named Floridian and Central Floridian of the Year of 2019. As president and executive director of FRRC, which is recognized for its work on voting and criminal justice reform issues, Desmond led the FRRC to a historic victory in 2018 with the successful passage of Amendment 4, a grassroots citizens initiative which restored the voting rights to over 1.4 million Floridians with past felony convictions. Amendment 4 represented the single largest expansion of voting rights in the United States in half a century, and it brought an end to 150 years of Jim Crow era law in Florida. A much sought after speaker, Desmond has made numerous appearances on radio and television, and has spoken before national organizations like the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, uh, Bread for the World. He's testified before congressional members and staffers and was part of a delegation to the United Nations where he gave testimony regarding disenfranchisement in Florida. Desmond orchestrated a historic meeting at the White House between returning citizens and President Obama's administration. Most recently, Desmond served as a commissioner for the National Commission on COVID-19 and Criminal Justice, which was co-chaired by former U.S. Attorneys General Loretta Lynch and Alberto Gonzalez. He is also a member of the Council on Criminal Justice. He has appeared on numerous shows on, such as Al Jazeera, Democracy Now!, MSNBC with Joy Ann Reed, Fox News and, uh, with Dana Perino and Tucker Carlson, on Samantha Bee, and All In with Chris Hayes. He's also a guest columnist for the Huffington Post, in which one of his articles about the death of Trayvon Martin garnered national attention. Uh, Desmond Mead has been featured in several newspaper and magazine articles and was chosen as a game changer by Politic 365, as well as being recognized as a foot soldier on Melissa ha the Melissa Harris Perry Show on MSNBC. On a personal note, you should also note that he is married and has five beautiful children. And with such a busy guy, uh, I have to say I'm so thankful that he was able to take time to be with us today, albeit virtually. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming Desmond Mead. Thank you so much for the introduction, President McGrath. First of all, uh, I would like to honor the Office of the President and the Dean, faculty, administration, staff, most of all, the graduating class of Western Michigan University Cooley Law School. It is an honor to be here among you all. Well, actually, virtually, I apologize for not being in person, but due to unforeseen issues, uh, I was unable to be in your presence. Uh, to the graduating class, I want to salute you and let you know that you have accomplished such a monumental task. And I also would be remiss if I didn't mention of uh, faculty and staff and, and some of the students uh, at the law school who have played a very important role this year in working with my organization, the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition on our fines and fees uh, campaign. And so, so many students and of course faculty members that, that played an important role in creating a more inclusive democracy for people in the Hillsborough County as well as Pinellas County who were too poor or could not afford to pay any kind of outstanding legal financial obligations which barred them from being able to vote. But, but because of your efforts, we know that more and more people in the Hillsborough County area now have access to democracy. So thank you so much uh, for your efforts. But for our graduating class, listen, I, you know, I spent, uh, what, about two weeks really thinking about what am I gonna talk to you all about? You know, you all have 
you know, gone through years of, of, of law school, and I, you know, I reminisce about when I went through law school and the ups and downs, and especially that first year, that was real, uh, oh my God, it was, it was almost a nightmare. Uh, as a matter of fact, I got at the end of my first year of law school, I ended up getting dismissed from the law school uh, because of, of my grades. But I was able to be readmitted, and after getting readmitted in the law school, I ended up finishing out uh, the rest of my three years, uh, ended up graduating uh, with honors. I actually made the dean's list, believe that. But you know, I was just thinking about, you know, that you all have gone through so much. You know, just the mere fact that you are here right now, looking at me, listening to my voice with your family, your loved ones, your friends, uh, celebrating this moment speaks volumes of your fortitude and your ability to overcome. And a word overcome kept coming up as I was thinking about what to say. And I just thought, hey, Desmond, just share your story a little bit. You know, and, and, and so that's what I want to do. You know, uh, in August of 2005, I, I was living in South Florida, and I found myself standing in front of railroad tracks one day, waiting on a train to come so I can jump in front of it. I remember as I was standing there, I was at the lowest point of my life. You know, I didn't see any light at the end of the tunnel. You know, I didn't have any hope. I didn't have any self-esteem. And I was ready to, to end my life. You know, I, I, I felt kind of bad because I thought about, you know, my parents. I, you know, I was not raised in a bad family, you know. And my mother and, and father uh, showered me with love throughout my adolescent and teenage years. You know, but there I was, and I knew that they didn't raise me to be in that position. And I waited, and I waited. And the main thing that was dominating my mind was how much pain I was going to feel when that train crushed my body. And I'm going to tell you, I'm, you know, I'm a wimp. You know, I'm scared of needles. But even the thought of the pain that I would have to endure when that train ran over me was not enough to make me move. And I stood there, and I waited, and I waited. But God had other plans, and that train didn't come that day. And I ended up crossing those tracks, and I walked a couple blocks further, and I checked myself in the drug treatment. But when I initially crossed those tracks, I did stop, and I looked back at those tracks, and I had asked myself an extremely important question. I said, Desmond, if you would have died, if the train would have came and killed you, right, how many people would have come to your funeral? And when I thought about it, my initial or immediate response was nobody would have came because I was homeless. I was addicted to crack cocaine. I was recently released from prison. I was unemployed. I didn't even have any identification on me. And more than likely, I would have been buried in a pauper's grave. And that was a lonely feeling. And so I, I, I rearranged the fact pattern. And I said, okay, Desmond, the train kills you, but... You know, the Miami Herald have your story in the front page, top of the fold, bold headlines, Desmond killed by train. How many people now would come to your funeral? And I thought long and hard, and I could only come up with four people. And maybe out of the four people, maybe two would have shed a tear. And the thought of only four people being at my funeral was a very sobering thought. I used to tell folks it, it was like, I felt like, getting hit in the gut with a, by Mike Tyson blow. It was, it, was, it was humiliating. It was depressing. And I remember taking those feelings with me as I walked uh, a couple blocks further and I checked myself into drug treatment. And while I was in drug treatment in 2005, Rosa Parks passed away. And I remember the day I was sitting in a room by myself and I was watching uh, I guess it was like CNN or one of the news channels, as they were uh, 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 broadcasting Rosa Parks, uh, I would say, uh, almost like a memorial. She, they had her laying in state in the rotunda of the uh, Capitol in D.C., and they were broadcasting how people were going by and paying their last uh, final respects. And I remember watching and seeing so many people with tears in their eyes, and and, and, and that moment just motivated me. And, and the next thing you know, I was jumping up and I was screaming at the television. I was like, that's it. That's it. That's what I want. 
I started screaming and my mind was racing and I was planning my own funeral. When I seen the amount of people that were paying their respects to Rosa Parks and the amount of people that were sad that she passed away, I reflected back to that day in front of those railroad tracks when I thought about only four people coming to my funeral. And I wanted what she had, and my mind started racing, and I, I started planning my funeral, and, and I landed uh, in the spot. I thought I was going to have my funeral at Joe Robbie Stadium where the Miami Dolphins play. I wanted the stadium packed with people. I even wanted people like chairs on the field. I didn't want any empty seat in the house and not one dry eye. And I stopped for a second, and I thought about, man, Dolphins Stadium holds a lot of people. How is me, Desmond, going to get that many people to come to my funeral? You know, and I thought, well, what type of person could command that type of audience? And I came up with two. Either you, uh, it was, you're going to be a movie star or you're going to be an athlete. And, you know, I played a little football back in my high school days, but I didn't think I was good enough to be in the pros. And so I quickly crossed off uh, being an athlete. And then my mind went to a movie star, and unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, depending on how you view it, you know, when I thought about movie star, the only person that came to my mind was Denzel Washington. And, you know, I didn't think I was a bad-looking guy. I still don't, you know, but I didn't think that I was Denzel Washington type of handsome. And so I immediately, you know, got depressed because I couldn't be an athlete. I couldn't be a movie star. You know, I tell folks today, thank God, you know, when it came to the movie star piece, that I didn't think of Forrest Whitaker because I know I'm much better looking than Forrest Whitaker. And if I would have thought of it back then, maybe I would have pursued some type of career in acting. But at the time, unfortunately, only person I could think about was Denzel. And I knew I couldn't be a, an actor, at least a Denzel Washington type of actor. Uh, but my mind went back to Rosa Parks. And the fact that she committed an act, she did something that resulted in a positive impact in people's lives that we feel even up to the day. And I thought, Desmond, maybe if I could, if you could just take all of the pain and the suffering and the low self-esteem that led you to the railroad tracks, and if, you, and if you could somehow package it in such a way to help others, right, maybe pretty soon, you know, if you could help other people, then they'll be able to help other people and so on and so on. And pretty soon you'll be able to, you know, maybe get a decent sized crowd for your funeral. Now, I'm going to tell you, I didn't know what to do, but, you know, I just knew that somehow or another I had to use whatever personal life experiences I had, whatever things that were, whatever the things were that I went through, I had to figure out a way to use that to help others to make my community to make this world a better place. And I remember the first time where I experienced where I had a positive impact in someone's life. I was, as a matter of fact, I was still uh, in drug treatment at the time. And I remember after a, a session, a young man approached me and he told me that, you know, something that I said caused him to have a, a paradigm shift, caused him to have a, a brighter outlook in life, caused him to have hope. And I remember as he was telling me that, something erupted inside of me that I had never felt in my entire life. Today, I can tell you that at that moment, what I was experiencing was a joy that I never knew existed. It was a joy that I was chasing all of my life and didn't even know I was chasing it. You know, and I equate what I was experiencing at that moment was to, uh, uh, I, would, I, I think I would equate it to discovering what my purpose in life was. Discovering that, you know, no matter what title I may have or may not have, no matter how much or how little money I may have, that there's always someone that's less fortunate than me. There's always someone out there that can benefit from me, which means that I always have an opportunity to give back. You know, as I look around through the windows, as I'm out in the parks and, and I look at nature and I see you know, all of the beautiful things that God has created. I think about how it is just so natural for us to take some things and then also to give back, right? And it's the giving back that is so essential. It's the giving back that is important for each and every one of you graduates today. 
you know, understanding that you worked hard to earn this Juris Doctorate degree. Yes, you did. And you overcame many obstacles and you, you overcame many tests, trials, and tribulations. But in the attainment of this Juris Doctorate degree, there is an inherent obligation to give back. And when I experienced that, that joy that I never knew existed, all I wanted to do from then on was I, every day I would pray that God would give me the strength, the stamina, the wisdom to just do his work, to just give back, to make someone's life, even if it's just putting a smile on someone's, a stranger's face, but God would give me the strength that every day that I wake up that I am doing something to improve the lives of someone else, my community, this country, the world. And I dove in. I dove in head first. And I ended up uh, enrolling in Miami-Dade College in the Paralegal Program, uh, able to graduate with a few degrees there, and eventually I was accepted in law school at Florida International University College of Law, and in May of 2014, I graduated with a Juris Doctorate degree while leading Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. You know, I tell folks that, you know, when I was at those railroad tracks that if somebody would have approached me and said, Desmond, don't jump in front of the train because in a few years you're going to serve on boards with commissioners and mayors and, and dignitaries and and in a few years, you're going to meet the President of the United States not once but twice. And, and you're going to lead a, a, a statewide organization that's going to lead a ballot initiative to restore voting rights to 1.4 million people with previous felony convictions. If somebody would have told me to not jump in front of a train because eventually I'll be named Time Magazine 100 most influential person in the world or... or, or, or be named the MacArthur Genius Fellow, if somebody would have told me all of those things when I was standing at those railroad tracks, I'll be honest with you, the first question I would have asked them was, where did they get that good dope that they're smoking? Because <laughs> there is no way you could have convinced me then that a person who was an addict, a drug addict, who, who'd been in and out of prison and jail, a person who was homeless, record a mile long, there's no way you could have convinced me that someone like me would have been able to attain the things that I attained. But I am here today to let you know that, yes, <laughs> there's nothing that we can't overcome. There's nothing that we can't attain if, if we believe in ourselves enough and if, if we dedicate ourselves, our lives, to making the world a better place, if we dedicate our lives to giving back. See, one of the things I learned early on is that, man, the, the, the degrees are great. The medals are great. The honor cords are great. The titles are great. But if they do not benefit the world, if they don't benefit your community, if they don't benefit your country, then what good are they? They're nothing but adornments. And so I implore that, you know, as you move on in life, as you go beyond to your next journey, to the next stage in life, as you relish the accomplishments that you have just made, that you look forward to in the future, to taking these accomplishments and figuring out ways to turn them into good, to make sure that others are able to benefit from that. So I want to leave you with three things, three things. Number one is that to understand and realize that we are nothing but a small bit, a small particle in this great universe. And as we move forward, that, that we should find ways to see how we can connect with something that's greater than us individually. That's what I did. I knew that whatever it is that I was doing, it had to be bigger than just Desmond. It had to be bigger than just what I wanted, right? It had to be bigger than what would just make me happy. 
it had to be connected to something greater than me. And so connect with something that is greater than you. The other thing is to find your passion and your purpose. Find your passion and your purpose. And realize that when you talk about a passion or you talk about a purpose, it is something that you are committed to and not just contrib contributing to. See, a lot of times folks get confused about the difference between a, a commitment and a contribution. See, the things that you may contribute to is not necessarily your passion. And it's not necessarily to your purpose. When you find that passion and that purpose, those are the things that you will be committed to. And sometimes, because people don't know the difference, I often share with them a short story about the ham and cheese omelet. That if you, if, if you ever find yourself trying to figure out whether you're committing to something or you're just contributing to something, you think about the ham and cheese omelet. But we know in a ham and cheese omelet, the ingredients are the egg, ham, and cheese. And, and milk, if you were poor like me, I use milk, you know, to help stretch the eggs. But we know that the, the, the egg comes from the chicken. We know that the cheese and the milk comes from the cow. And we know that the ham comes from the pig. Well, the chicken made a contribution to the ham and cheese omelet. The pig, I'm sorry, the cow made the contribution to the ham and cheese omelet. The pig, however, made a commitment to the ham and cheese omelet. For those of you all who didn't get that, that chicken was able to lay an egg and go about with the rest of their lives. That cow was able to stand still and let someone milk it so they can make the milk and the cheese. But the pig, the pig had to give his life. There was no coming back from that. And that's the difference, because when you're committed to something, you are willing to give your life it is often said that if a man cannot find something that's worth dying for, it's not worth living. So when you find that passion and that purpose, you know you found it by the, your level of commitment, knowing that you're willing to lay down your life. And I was fortunate to be able to find mine. And that was to make sure that every American citizen in this country have an opportunity to vote. And I know that I am willing to lay down my life to ensure that we have a more inclusive democracy. Find your passion, find your purpose. And I promise you when you do, you will impact so many lives. And then the last thing I would leave you with is above all, lead with love. Lead with love. You know, when we led, I led the effort to pass Amendment 4 in 2018, it was the amendment that restored voting rights to people with previous felony convictions. And one of the things that I always used to brag about was, I remember on election night, we had over uh, 5.1 million people who voted yes on Amendment 4. And, and, and it, it was, you know, when you talk about restoring voting rights to people with previous felony convictions, that's a very controversial topic. It's still controversial uh, even today. Uh, on a national level and in various states. And there were so many people when I that, that believed when we launched the campaign that it was going to fail because of how controversial it was and how controversial a state Florida is. But in November 2018, let me tell you, over 64% of the people voted for it, and we had over a million people who were conservative that voted for Amendment 4, and I, and I used to love to tell folks that, that, you know, we had such a wide, diverse group of supporters for this, but the most important thing was the fact that those 5.1 million votes, none of them were based on hate, none of them were based on fear, but rather there were 5.1 million votes that was based on love, forgiveness, and redemption. And we showed the world that love can, in fact, win the day that we can move major issues, we can improve people's lives, we can change major policies without having to tear each other apart, without having to divide our communities or our country, or without having to motivate people through uh, uh, hate or, 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 or through fear. 
that we could actually accomplish this through love. You know, I remember uh, 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 it, the saying that says that, that hate can't defeat hate and fear can't drive out fear. But what can, can defeat the hate and the fear is love. And I've learned throughout my years that if we are, are driven by love, right, not by selfish reasons, if, you know, the things that I've done, it wasn't to make Desmond great, it wasn't to give Desmond a name, it wasn't to give Desmond the degree or the honors that I've received. What I have done have always been to just make this world a better place because I love humanity. And e even though I can't see you all today, you know, I love each and every one of you all. And so my work was driven by love. And I, 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 I challenge you to let your work, the rest of your journey, let your work be driven by love, no matter what it is that you do. And if love is the driving force, once again, lives will be impacted. And your time on this planet, the work that you put in to get this degree, and other degrees, if you're, if you're going beyond this level, will all be worthwhile. Knowing that at the time comes, the time when the time comes that, that you have to leave this earth, that you would know that your time served on this planet have been well worth it. Once again, I want to congratulate graduating class I want to honor your accomplishments, your journey, and encourage you as you move forward today. Let love be your driving force. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Desmond Reed, for those inspiring words. It is now my privilege to introduce Assistant Dean and Associate Professor Kathy Gustafson, who will lead the presentation of candidates for graduation. Professor Gustafson? Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a little bit easier. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments, the members of the graduating class will be receiving their degrees. This is an important and solemn occasion, and we request that all persons in the assembly remain in their seats during the ceremony until all of the degrees have been conferred. A professional photographer will be taking pictures of the graduates as they receive their diploma. Each graduate will receive a complimentary 5 by 7 copy of his or her photo. Thank you for your cooperation. The faculty of the Western Michigan University Thomas M. Cooley Law School has established criteria for the courses of instruction, the standards of achievement, and the periods of residence necessary to ensure professional proficiency and practical scholarship in the law, and has also established the requirements for the degrees Juris Doctor and Master of Laws. The board has been advised that as of the end of Michaelmas term 2021, 111 Juris Doctor students and six Master of Law students of the class known as the Horace Gray class were found to have fulfilled all of the requirements for those degrees. Now, therefore, it is resolved that the degrees are awarded once all final grades are calculated and the candidates who are presented to the President and Dean of the Western Michigan University, Thomas M. Cooley Law School, will receive the degrees of Juris Doctor at his hand. President McGrath, the faculty proudly presents the Juris Doctor candidates. Edwin and Kuma. Lucero 
Ayala Feliciano. Yanesi Sid Rodriguez, cum laude. United States Marine Corps veteran, Christopher Carl Condon, cum laude. Sarah Nicole Cook. Claudia Cruz, cum laude. Marvin Dasher, Jr. Carissa Falcon Dewberry. Russell Jacob Dewberry. Brianna Dimler, magna cum laude. Chate Ajo Zikanu. Adriana Manche Evans, cum laude. Magna Farid Rudy. John L. Fernandez. Daniel Milton Faree Jr. Magna Cum Laude. Lindsay Buell. <laughs> United States Army Reservist, Erica Fontanez. <laughs> Clarence Edward Hollins III. Laisa Hyacinth. <laughs> Courtney Jekyll. <laughs> Zachary Hara. Samuel Jopa Chen. Brandon James Kemp, cum laude. Susan Elizabeth Lee. Kimberly Grace Lewis, cum laude. <laughs> Rachel Catherine McLaughlin. <laughs> United States Army veteran, Butch Mathenia. Lilianette Maderos Orama, cum laude. <laughs> Jeanette Astrid Miranda, magna cum laude.
Michelle Morton. Sonia Nishku. Ashley Lauren Palmer. Yasmin Ramaha, cum laude. Anna Patricia Reyes, magna cum laude. Kimberly Roche, cum laude. Jenny Ladies Rodriguez. Samantha Marie Roth Knuckles. John Thomas Sunuto III. Nardine Shenuda. Yeah. Anaya Janae Smith Marset, cum laude. <laughs> Nina Simone Sterling, magna cum laude. Denise Rushton Suters, cum laude. <laughs> Tierra Yvonne Thompson. <laughs> Julie Torres, cum laude. from our May of 2021 class, Earl Harmon, cum laude. Also from our May of 2021 class, Sarah Roberge, magna cum laude. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I proudly present to you the graduates of the Horace Gray class. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations to all the graduates. We will now welcome back President McGrath, who will give his closing remarks. I'll try to keep this brief. I know I'm standing between you and your uh, celebration, so. Graduates, congratulations again on this very significant milestone in your life. When things get tough, I'm going to ask you to remember why you came to law school in the first place. Some of you came here to change the world. Others of you just change your lives. Whatever it is that brought you here, whatever that passion was, 
and I pray we haven't beaten all that passion out of you in the past three years. Um, let that passion keep you going strong as you meet the challenges of your, your career as a lawyer. And speaking of challenges, for those of you who have not yet taken the bar exam, one thing I want you to remember, and I think Professor Fisher reminded you of this, is your mindset going into the, the bar exam is important. How you approach the bar exam. Now you could say, I just graduated law school, and now I have to take the bar exam. Or you could say, I just graduated law school, and now I get to take the bar exam. Yeah. No. Wait, hang on now. <laughs> Taking the bar exam is a great privilege. N not everyone graduates college, but you all did. I know that. N a very small people get into law school, and you all did. And even a smaller number get out of law school and graduate, but you all did it. And so now you get to take the bar exam. Yes! I know this sounds kind of warped, but you've earned it. <laughs> and it's going to be tough, all right? But I'm confident every one of you can do it. And if you ever feel like the preparation is overwhelming, and it will be, remember you're doing all this hard work, not just for yourselves, but for your colleagues, for your family and your friends, so you can become those, those lawyers you dreamed about being. So in closing, I want to thank, again, I want to thank everyone for sharing our graduate celebration of their incredible achievements. And graduates, although you're finishing up an important chapter in your life at WMU Cooley, that book is not yet completed. We're here ready to share in your successes and in any setbacks you may encounter as you become great lawyers and judges and leaders. So stay in touch and please become an active member in our alumni association. You can stand tall with over 20,000 WMU Cooley graduates around the world. Continue to make us all proud of you. And now one more thing, Karen Smithman. Take us home. Thank you all. Thank you, President McGrath. This concludes our commencement ceremony for the Horace Gray class. We ask that all guests please remain seated until the members of the academic procession depart. Thank you. <laughs>